sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Tonight, President Biden tests positive for COVID after being vaccinated, plus with two boosters. And Twitter takes Elon Musk to court. We've got that and more tonight on this Friday, July 22nd, 2022. Hi, I'm Andre Laborde. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up on this Friday, July 22nd, 2022. I hope your week went well. Well, coming up tonight, unless you've just woken up like Rip Van Winkle or just been rescued off Gilligan's Island, you know of Elon Musk's decision to purchase Twitter for $44 billion and then his decision, or maybe it was buyer's remorse, and cancel the sale. Well, Twitter doesn't like to be left at the altar. So last week, Twitter sued Elon Musk to go through with the sale. Tonight, we're going to be talking with adjunct professor of law at Loyola and a partner at Jones Walker Law Firm, Ken Nager. Ken teaches securities law at Loyola School of Law, and, well, you can also say he also practices what he preaches, where he's a partner at Jones Walker specializing in mergers and acquisitions and securities law. Ken Nager is going to be here to tell us just who is holding a better hand and, and who might be bluffing. Ken will be here in just a moment. But first, how did the markets do this week? Well, all the markets ended the week in the green. The S&P 500 for July is up 5.6 percent so far for this month of July, which is the best S&P 500 has done since October of last year. And the NASDAQ, they're having a good month of July as well, with their index up almost 9.5 percent for the month. And this week, the Dow Jones ended at 31,900, and that was up almost 2% for the week. The S&P 500 closed at 3,961. That was up 2.5% for the week. And the NASDAQ, they ended at 11,834, up 3.3% for the week. Analysts are raising their price targets on selected stocks. Oppenheimer raised their price target of Tesla to an outperform with a new price at $1,290. You think they could raise it just $10 more to make it an even $1,300. Well, MKM Partners raised their raised Snap to a buy with a $26 price target this week, and Cohen and Company raised their price target on Netflix as to a buy at $325 a share, stating that Netflix will be including ads in their streaming services and a password sharing crackdown. Well, Twitter is suing Elon Musk, but don't feel too sorry for Elon. Because of his Tesla stock, when you add in his stock options, he owns, as, as of last quarterly filing, 265 million shares of Tesla. Now, in this month of July, Tesla stock has risen over 16 percent. So just off a $700 price target, which was what the stock was at around July the 1st, beginning of this month, and the close of today of $816, Musk is up approximately $32 billion, which is what he agreed to put up for the purchase of Twitter. Now, the remainder, of which is because it's a $44 billion sale, he was going to be borrowing. But now that Twitter stock is down, that portion of the borrowed funds, that may be in jeopardy. Well, that makes a perfect segue into our guest this evening. Ken Nager is a partner at Jones Walker Law Firm. He specializes in securities law and mergers and acquisitions. And he's also an adjunct professor of law at Loyola. Hi, Ken. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up. Thanks. Really thrilled to be here. Appreciate being invited. Unless you you woke up like Rip Van Winkle or you climbed out from a from a deserted island somewhere, everybody's heard about right now the the lawsuit between Twitter and and Elon Musk. Right. And that's why we're glad to have you. Um, you know, normally as a as a lawyer, you don't get to pick and choose sometimes which side of a of a of a client you want to be on. Right. But if you had the choice between being on the the plaintiff side, which in this case would be Twitter, or the defense side, which is Elon Musk. Who would you rather? Who's got the better hand? Well, Andre, I'll tell you. 
I, I'll have only one caveat throughout the whole presentation, but I'll put it first. Uh, right now, uh, pretty much all the information we have on the proceedings are based on press reports. Some of them are inaccurate. We've also got the merger agreement. So the information's incomplete at this point, but I think we know enough at this point that the real answer to your question is Twitter has the high side. They're in a stronger position to start. And uh, Elon Musk could win, he could prevail, but he's going to have to pull a rabbit out of the hat. And so far, there's no real evidence of the rabbit. What Twitter is trying to prove is that, look, this is just a simple purchase agreement that he signed a waiver of waiving all of his rights, and he agreed to buy at, in this case, $44, $44 billion. Right. Uh, Elon Musk has agreed to sell, and that's it. But on Elon Musk's side, he's saying, well, wait a second. I'm still willing to buy it, but there were, there were material facts that were uh, omitted prior to this. Exactly. Am I understanding that correctly? No, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that Twitter is starting on the high side here, or in a more favorable position, is that the merger agreement that the party signed back in April is very pro-Twitter, pro-seller. Uh, what I mean by that is Elon Musk could have negotiated a whole long laundry list of closing conditions, which is just a, another way of saying uh, excuses for not having to proceed to close the actual purchase. He didn't do that, though, and the laundry list of excuses he has for not performing is very short. Um, so he starts behind the eight ball at that point. In addition, he's unfortunately in front of the Delaware Chancery Courts, which are famous for being very um, stringent on enforcing binding contracts. Uh, and lastly, he's got the chancellor right now, Chancellor McCormick. Uh, and in the preliminary first ruling in this litigation, which is from uh, July 19th of this week, uh, the initial ruling favored Twitter. So Twitter's starting in a very strong position. Why is it? You know, you've got, when publicly traded companies, you've got headquarters in, in almost 50 states, mostly in New York, New Jersey, maybe, Texas, California, and such. But when it comes to incorporating, almost all of them, if not all, are registered or incorporated in Delaware. What is it about Delaware that publicly traded companies like to incorporate there? Well, this is at least a 100-year story or more, but uh, a long time ago, Delaware uh, sought out uh, develop a consistent body of case law in the corporate area, and they've successfully done that. So there's a very well-established body of law, and so a lot of corporations like the certainty of knowing what the, the ground rules are between disputes with boards of directors or shareholders. And so uh, with a lot of companies incorporating in Delaware, that puts a lot of the uh, decision-making in the hands of the Delaware Chancery Courts, and that's exactly where this dispute has landed. I'm assuming that before the agreement was made, that he had to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, I'm sure that, he did. Before yeah. Twitter would show maybe some sensitive documents. But now that Twitter is suing Elon Musk, and Musk is the defendant, and I'm sure there would be the discovery phase of the trial before, before it actually goes into a courtroom. That's right. Would he be released from this NDA to be able to, to defend himself? Yeah, Andre, that's a really good question. It, it's hard to know with certainty because the, these non-disclosure agreements are virtually never publicly disclosed. So they're private agreements that don't make it into the public domain. That being said, it is very common for them to be tightly worded, but they'll generally have carve-outs or excuses f from the uh, confidentiality requirement in certain cases. And one of them typically is if uh, regulators insist on disclosures or there's some sort of court process. So I think one of those exclusions probably is in that agreement. It'll probably apply, and that means that even if Elon Musk was bound to some form of secrecy, uh, he'll be able to defend himself in court. Would he be able to have an out then by saying, like, let's say the chancery says you can, you can disclose this portion of the NDA, but you can't disclose that portion? Then he would say, well, wait a second, I, I'm trying to defend myself, and the portion that was excluded is, in other words, he, he would be given maybe an out. Without knowing precisely what the, the, the terms of that non-disclosure agreement say, it's hard to give a real firm answer, but I would think uh, the Delaware courts would be pretty sympathetic to an individual having to defend against claims uh, and, and to be able to, you know, make um, its arguments in court. So I think they'll give them leeway to do that, is my suspicion. Uh, there was an expedite, there was a, a hearing, and Twitter wanted 
the trial to be brought up sooner in September. Elon Musk wanted it to be coming up early part of next year, and even for the length of trial. And she, uh, although they, she didn't put September, she put the, the trial date as in October. Right. We're, we're looking at probably, as we are right now, maybe around, what's that, about 80 days, 90 days or so. Yeah. In, in, your, in your experience, is that enough time for interrogatories, discovery, and for especially the things that, that probably Elon Musk is trying to do to show that there are more bots and more fake accounts than, than was actually um, first told to him? It's a great question. Uh, Twitter clearly would answer that by saying yes. That's what they've pleaded. They think this should be moving quickly. Their argument is there's irreparable harm to the company and we need to get on with this and get to uh, some sort of resolution. Uh, Elon Musk had the exact opposite position uh, and Twitter was able to convince the Delaware uh, Chancellor, uh, Chancellor McCormick, to go with uh, essentially a fast track. I do think, I don't litigate, but I do think that is probably enough time uh, because the, the Delaware Chancery Courts are used to these sort of disputes where the clock's ticking. They're very good about expedited hearings. Uh, there's going to have to be a lot of depositions, a lot of uh, uh, spade work done before a trial can begin. Uh, but I think there's likely enough. Now, if Elon Musk was listening to this, he would probably violently disagree. He'd say, I've got very factual, uh, specific inquiries about digging into the number of fake accounts or bots, as they're called, uh, that Twitter has in its uh, customer base. And he would say, I need a lot more time to do that. But unfortunately, he made that argument in front of the chancellor and he lost. There's a law, Ken, and it's uh, called the Sarbanes-Oxley law. And you probably know backwards and forwards much better than I, but this was a law that came out about 10, maybe 15 years ago. And every quarter for publicly traded companies because of Sarbanes-Oxley, the CFO brings the quarterly report to the CEO, and right. he or she has to sign off saying everything in there is true, and basically putting his or her name on that dotted line. That's right. Now, I'm curious if, let's say, in the quarterlies, they say, because Twitter is saying there's 5% bots or fake accounts. Now, let's say Elon Musk may be able to hypothetically, and I'm, we're just talking hypothetically here, right. may be able to prove that there are more than 5%. Maybe there is a materially more that would show maybe 15% or 20% more bots or fake accounts. Would that open up people like the CEO of, of Twitter and maybe members of the board of directors or the chairman of the board for problems with the SEC because they were saying on quarterly reports in that Sarbanes-Oxley bill law that we guarantee that only 5% of the of the accounts for bots. Yeah, Andre, I'll, I'll tell you, I started out by saying uh, Elon Musk may have to pull a rabbit out of his hat. That would be the actual rabbit. What, <laughs> what, what he really is going to have to try to prove uh, to be able to prevail, I think, in my judgment, is that these disclosures uh, that have been in the public domain for several years now are false, and they're materially false. So to get back to what Twitter's been saying, actually, they've been saying that the number of false accounts or bots are um, uh, less than 5%, but they've consistently had disclosure saying, we have a difficult time calculating the precise number, and the precise number could be higher or lower. So they put people on notice, it could be higher. Um, that is likely to be viewed as a true statement if the number of bots, in fact, are, you know, 5, 6, 7%. If Elon Musk, though, could prove it's materially incorrect, like in, in your case, it's 15% or 20%. That would go to the whole value of how much Twitter is actually worth. Uh, advertisers would be willing to pay less for advertising, uh, and the market value of, of Twitter really would be lower at that point if that can be proved. So that's really the crux of Elon Musk's dilemma here. Uh, he's trying to buy time. He didn't get an initial victory, uh, but he needs time to dig into the bot numbers and see if he can make a case. Back to your Sarbanes-Oxley question, if all this happens and Elon Musk prevails, it's a game changer in a couple of ways. Uh, the litigation odds are gonna shift back in favor of Elon Musk, and to your point, Twitter's gonna be in a whale of trouble at that point. Uh, they'll have years of inaccurate statements 
uh, and likely the plaintiff bar will come after them with uh, class action suits for misrepresentations made in their public reports. And on top of that, they'll probably get uh, suits by their advertisers against them saying, uh, we spent advertising dollars with you guys at Twitter under false pretenses. So it would, it would create a very, very significant set of problems for Twitter. And I never thought about the advertisers, too, because yeah. then they could come back on there, too. Can, right. a, can a judge, Ken, force a person to buy something that he or she may not really want to buy? Yeah, they, they can under certain circumstances. And normally, um, when you sue for breach of contract, the normal remedy would be money damages. But there is something called specific performance. And Elon Musk actually agreed uh, in the merger agreement back from April that either side can specifically enforce the agreement. That means uh, either side can go to court and force the other one to perform its obligation. So it works both ways. If for some reason uh, Twitter uh, wanted out, Elon Musk could go into a court and basically say, I want to specifically enforce your obligation. It also, unfortunately for Elon Musk, works the opposite way. And that's precisely what Twitter is arguing right now. They're, they're, going, they're, they're playing hardball right now and taking a very hardline, aggressive position saying, uh, nothing is acceptable to us other than Elon Musk completing the deal at $54 a share. Can a judge force a person, force two parties to settle or just make it maybe so hard on them that they'll go, let's go ahead and settle this thing? Technically, Andre, the answer is no. They really don't have the power to do that. Both sides would have to agree. But behind the scenes, I think this goes on a lot. I mm -hmm. wouldn't be surprised if it's not going on here too. Um, one of the dilemmas the Delaware court has here is that Although these specific performance clauses are in a lot of agreements, it's a little bit of an untested area. There was a case in 2019, much, much, much smaller, much more simpler case, where there was a judgment from a Delaware uh, chancery court to specifically enforce a buyer and force them to go through with a sale. So it has been done, but it's not that common. What's much more challenging here is you've got a maverick like Elon Musk, mm -hmm. you've got a very, very complicated financing plan where Morgan Stanley has to um, essentially close on a series of complicated uh, debt financing transactions. And then Elon Musk needs to sell a lot of his stock to put equity into the deal. And essentially, uh, for this to work, uh, if the judge were to try to order a specific performance, um, there's a lot of hurdles there to actually get things over the finish line. I bring all this up to get back to a central point, uh, and that is the Delaware courts are probably going to be a little nervous about if they issue a specific performance judgment, in other words, forcing Elon Musk to close. Can they actually enforce it? Uh, you go back to the famous quote of Andrew Jackson back uh, in the 19th century where he said, the Supreme Court has ruled. Now let, let's see uh, them actually enforce it. In the Delaware courts like this, are there appeals processes? Well, like if you don't like the lower court ruling, you can always appeal it to a higher court? Yeah. Uh, in a lot of, lot of jurisdictions, it's a three-tier system. But in the Delaware Chancery Courts, any appeals, and by the way, either party would have a chance to appeal here, but the appeal would go right up to the Delaware Supreme Court. Uh, so it's just a two-tier level. And the Delaware Supreme Court is used to these sort of cases on a fast track. So one of the uh, dynamics that uh, Chancellor McCormick was thinking about is trying to make sure there's enough time in here for her to make a ruling and then uh, a few weeks left for it to go to the Delaware Supreme Court and get a final judgment. Ken is a partner at Jones Walker Law Firm. He's also an adjunct professor of law over at, at Loyola University. So glad to have him. Don't go away. We'll be right back. talking with Ken Nager. He is a partner at Jones Walker Law Firm, talking about the securities law of, of practice of the trial of going ons uh, and the circumstances. Twitter is suing Elon Musk for, the, for him to continue his purchase of Twitter. Is 
the type of person, and I'm calling her, normally I would say Judge McCormick, right. but in there, do you call them chancery? Is that a specific name, of, but it's the same yeah. as a judge? Yeah, it's a little bit unique to Delaware in their chancery courts, but yeah, uh, it's Judge McCormick. Uh, in Delaware, they're typically called the chancellor. There are uh, uh, five Look, I'm not a litigator. I think I'm getting this right. I believe there's five chancery court judges. She is the chief uh, of those five, so they call her the chancellor. The others are uh, assistant chancellors. I uh, see. So, and, you know, sometimes when you when you know about judges, you know, are they or he or she more pro-plaintiff or they're pro-defendant? Or you kind of get a feel of what type of a, of a personality a judge is. Has, have you known, have you, have you talked to anybody of, of just what kind of a personality Judge McCormick is to find out are they more pro-defendant, they're more pro-plaintiff? You know, it's a great question because this oftentimes drives results in a lot of litigation with all 50 states. I really don't have a good answer for here other than uh, the Delaware courts are pretty well known for being having an even keel, an even balance. One of the reasons that so many people incorporate there is they try to keep a very level playing field between uh, shareholder rights and company rights. Um, and I think, you know, she's going to try to enforce that. They've got a multi-decade reputation for doing that. Uh, this chancellor, Chancellor McCormick, has had a, a very fast rise. Um, she's only been on the chancellery courts for about four years, but after three years, she was uh, promoted to be the chief chancellor. And that's a very, very quick rise. So she's got uh, a very strong reputation. Uh, but really beyond that, I don't have a great feel for if either side is sort of uh, happy with the choice. When it comes to this type of a, a purchase agreement, many people, we've at one time or another, we've all had buyer's remorse about something, whether it be for a, from a suit of clothes, a car, a house, whatever it may be. But is there under pressure of Judge McCormick to enforce maybe the purchase agreement? Because if if this could be overturned, and I'm talking about by Elon Musk, could this open up a Pandora's box of other people of going, well, wait a second. Elon Musk did it way back in 2022. He, and back in 2022, this is case law that he was able to uh, undo a purchase agreement this way. So we're going to use the same thing. And I think that's exactly what the Delaware courts will be worrying about, what mm -hmm. Chancellor McCormick will be worrying about. And it's sort of the long history they have of being um, very um, in favor of enforcing contract rights. So I think that's going to be in the forefront of uh, her mind when she decides. So let's say if a purchase agreement was made by Elon Musk on a certain date, and now we're talking into the July going into August, or let's say, or let's say October of 2022, there have been changes that Twitter has made, whether they've hired people, they've fired people, they've made executive decisions on Twitter. Could, could Elon Musk say, well, wait a second, when I made this agreement to purchase, that was on such and such date. And since that time, these decisions were made by the CEO, which may affect or maybe materially affect my, my decision. Yeah, that's a provision in pretty much all merger agreements where the company that's being purchased, the seller, uh, has an obligation to run the business in the ordinary course. And the merger agreement between Twitter and Musk has something like that. This, in fact, is one of Elon Musk's arguments. He's saying that uh, since the time I signed the agreement, there's been layoffs, there's been problems at the business, and they have not always sought out uh, my approval to some of these changes. Uh, my understanding from reading some of the uh, press coverage is that um, uh, some of the Delaware litigators are not terribly impressed with the argument, but we'll see. Uh, just recently, this week, it was found that Paul Pelosi, who is the, the husband of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, uh, made millions in the, in the, uh, for the a stock called NVIDIA. And at the same time, it was going up to the Senate for the CHIPS Act that was about to be passed. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that I've, you know, when you talk about um, insider trading, there's also what's called the Stock Act. And the Stock Act uh, stopped trading uh, and, and it says it's an acronym for doing that. But is this is there whether you're talking about insider trading, it's not excluded for not other than those in Congress. Right. I mean, what has to be proven before you show that there has been or is insider trading? Yeah. Complicated question. Uh, the whole body of 
insider trading law is probably more complex than it should be. Uh, the reason is there's no single law you can go to that defines it. Um, and so the parameters can be a little bit murky. But clearly, it's not just the insider. So a clear insider would be someone on the board of directors of a company, an executive officer. Uh, they have obligations to keep that information confidential. Uh, and they can't, they either keep confidential or not trade, but they can't trade uh, while they're in possession of material inside information. Um, Congress realized several years ago that although that worked fine for corporate insiders, there was sort of a hole in the system because there was no way to regulate Congress. So they passed the Stock Act, which provides similar duties on a member of Congress. By analogy, uh, anyone who's married to an officer of a company uh, or a member of Congress, uh, if they take that information and trade indirectly and they benefit from it, they're likely to be in the same bad position as the actual corporate insider or, or uh, Congresswoman Pelosi. So this could be something interesting to follow if, in fact, um, the husband, uh, husband of Nancy Pelosi did trade on material undisclosed information. Um, it, it could be problematic for him. Ken, we're out of time, but I hope you come back. This is just opens up a, another Pandora's box. Thanks so much. Well, really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Andre. Thanks, Ken. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we'd love to hear from you. Make it pithy, make it concise, and write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. And now let's look ahead for market information for next week. But first, what mutual fund supermarket allowing investors to choose from hundreds of different funds opened on this day in 1971? We've got the answer in just a moment. Well, what mutual fund supermarket allowing investors to choose from hundreds of different funds opened on this day in 1971? Charles Schwab. The company capitalized on the financial deregulation of the 1970s and was the first not to charge transaction fees. Opened 51 years ago today, Charles Schwab. Well, finally tonight, are you a fan of the movie The Godfather? The story of Don Vito Corleone along with his sons Sonny and Fredo and Michael and the rest of his crime family? Well, if you are, next month is the 50th anniversary of the opening of The Godfather. And the owners of the home used in the filming are making you an offer you can't refuse. You can rent the home of the Corleone family on Airbnb for 30 days next month. So if you'd like to have calzones with Corleones, well, you can rent the home. The Staten Island, New York home has five bedrooms, seven bathrooms, along with a pub and game room, and it's going to be available on Airbnb next month in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the opening of The Godfather. Now, remember, when it's time to leave, remember, leave the gun, take the cannolis. And, well, next week, we're going to have Tulane University's Freeman School of Business professor, Peter Raschuti. In addition to being with Tulane School of Business, Peter is also the founder and, and he also heads up the Tulane's Birken Road Report. That's a student-run investment research program analyzing local Louisiana companies. We'll talk about markets and how the last half of 2022 is shaping up and looking to invest. With my guest next week, Tulane's Peter Raschuti. As a reminder, we repeat the show on Sunday mornings, but the best way, set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. And that is our show for this Friday, July 22nd, 2022. I hope you've enjoyed it. My thanks so much to Ken Nager for joining us this evening. But always, it's you. We appreciate you for allowing us into your homes tonight. Remember, follow us on all the social media, on Facebook, now known as Meta Platforms, YouTube and Twitter and WYES.org. So have a great weekend ahead and a productive week as well. I will see you next week. The Wall Street Wrap Up, I'm Andre Laborde. Remember, money never sleeps. Night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.